can I also begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and welcome Anne here tonight. So I was mentioning to Anne while we were backstage, I first came across her work when I was uh, a teenager. When I was at, in high school, I was at an all-girls Catholic school, and the effective, it must have been year 10s, won its academic, that TV quiz program. The girls team won it. We were about to go co-ed with a boys' school, and the prize was a computer. This is back in the early 1970s, so the computer was about the size of this room, uh, and the powers that be decided that the computer, won by the girls, should go to the boys' school. So I went home and I was like, I don't understand this. It doesn't make sense. It's not fair. Uh, my mum was working in a bookshop at the time and she started bringing home books that she thought might fuel my interest in um, addressing this uh, dire imbalance. And one of the books that she brought home, it must have been a series of essays, included an essay uh, on the establishment of the first feminist women's refuge in Australia, the Elsie Refuge for Women in Sydney, which of course Anne was one of the three women who uh, squatted uh, in an empty uh, house to, to create and what became uh, a movement really of uh, feminist, feminist run uh, women's refuges. So that was my first uh, crossing paths with Anne Summers and I have followed uh, with great interest uh, her career ever since. Her most recent uh, piece of work is about the choices or lack of choices uh, that women leaving domestic situations face in Australia. The policy history around income support uh, and uh, who those women really are. So I'm going to start our conversation, Anne, by asking some questions about uh, the report. It's really groundbreaking, I think, Anne, because it's, it's based on data that we haven't seen collated before. But I wonder if you might start um, our discussion tonight by describing who these women are. Thank you, Sue, and uh, thank you very much, everybody, for being here this evening. It's great uh, to see you all. Um, my report, which, uh, as Sue says, is called The Choice, um, is that I've got a little copy printed out that I printed out for myself so you can see what it looks like. But it actually uh, doesn't exist as a printed document, but you can get it online for free by going to www.violenceorpoverty.com. And I would encourage you to, to do that and to um, read the report. And also, if you're at all statistically minded, you can download all of, or at least read all of the, the incredible tables that were compiled by the ABS that provide the, the backup for this report. I mean, essentially what happened is that I became interested in, um, a couple of years ago, in the fact that our the conversation about domestic violence seemed to be stuck. It seemed to be that we were repeating ourselves, we were repeating the same old facts over and over. Um, we weren't advancing our understanding and we certainly weren't doing anything um, that, that appeared to be reducing the numbers of those affected by violence. And it seemed to me that there needed to be an injection of facts into the situation. And so I was um, bold enough to think that I could uh, have a go at, at, at trying to remedy that. And what I did was I went to, I'm sure those of you who, who know this area are familiar with the, the uh, personal safety survey, which the ABS conducts every four years or so, and which is Australia's only main uh, authoritative source of uh, violence, uh, Australians' experience of violence. It includes all forms of violence, street violence, stranger violence, and so on, but, it, but it, at its core, it is a reporting of what they call partner violence. So violence experienced by by some by okay by a co sorry experienced from a cohabiting partner. In other words, you have to have been living with that person, and been and have, have experienced physical, sexual, or emotional violence. 
to be counted in this report. And what I had noticed in reading the summary of this report is that the, it appeared that single mothers seem to be uh, experiencing violence at a greater rate than women in other households. And I... Can you me? Yeah, it's going in and out a little bit. And I tried to... Ch I checked this information with the Australian Bureau of Statistics and they said, well, actually, that's not quite right. I won't bore you with all the technical details, but they said that in order to really know what the sort of situation is with single mothers, we would need to do a customised data search for you. And as it turns out, that this information collected by the Personal Safety Survey every four years has millions and millions of data units, about you know 1% of which ever get to the public. So what they did is they went into the, the stuff that's never been looked at before and they pulled out some amazing data. And uh, just to summarise, what, what we found was that um, th of the 311,000 women who were our base sample, 185,700 of them had experienced partner violence. Now that is 60% of them had experienced partner violence. Now, the figure that's usually trotted out around Australia is that 17% of women have experienced partner violence. That figure itself is wrong, uh, is understated, and should never be used because when they, they, they calculate that figure by adding up all the women in Australia and, um, and, and, and dividing it by whatever, and including in that number women who have never had a partner. And so it doesn't make any logical sense to, to include them um, as having suffered partner violence. It's logically impossible. So if you, if you, that 17% figure is just bullshit. Um, if you look at all the women in Australia who've ever had a partner, uh, and have 22% of them have experienced partner violence, that is bad enough. But the single mothers are the ones who got my attention, 60%. And that raises that then raised so many questions that that I kind of you know was off on the on the on the trail as it were to find out what was going on, and there's two two things emerged. And the reason I've called my report the choice is that what I argue based on on the data that we've collected is that women who are experiencing violence in Australia at the moment face a, a real choice and a very tough choice. Now, at the moment, there are 275,000 Australian women living in violent relationships. A large number of those have left and come back. A lot, a, an even larger number want to leave but haven't. And in every case, those who've left and come back or those who want to leave but haven't, the reason they haven't left is because they have no money or nowhere to go. So we are because of our absence of, of a system that would ena enable these women to find financial support if they were to leave a violent relationship, we are, in, in a sense, tolerating the violence. Uh, certainly, we're enabling it uh, and making it continue. And we could reduce the amount of violence in Australia overnight by at least 38,000 cases if we were to enable that 38,000 women who want to leave but can't because they don't have any money to go. So that's the choice, that you, two choices. One is you stay, these, these 275,000 women, they stay, or my women, 185,700 of them, they leave. Of those who left, 50%, most of them have jobs, 60% of them have jobs, but most of them, the jobs they have are insufficiently rewarding to support their families. So they are, 50% uh, of them are on they total, rely totally for their income on government benefits. And that means, by definition, they are living in fairly abject poverty. And uh, I would just like to give you a couple of examples of what that means in Australia at the moment. For example, um, if you look at these women, uh, single mothers with children under the age of 18, 48.1% of them are grouped in the gross weekly equivalised household income quintile number one, the lowest quintile, which means they have a weekly income of between zero and $460 a week. And the second example I'll give you is that 60% um, of these women last year, in the last 12 months, before. Uh, experienced a 
one or more cash flow problem. 60% of them had a cash flow problem. 78,400 couldn't pay electric electricity, gas or phone bills on time. 27,800 sought assistance from welfare organisations. 24,000 couldn't pay the rent or mortgage on time. 23,700 pawned something. 20,500 were unable to heat or cool their houses. 17,400 went without meals. But the figure that really gets me, and the one that I think is, is the one that, that, that worries me the most, is that 36,300 women could not pay their car registration or insurance. Now we know that without a car in this country, you are pretty much stonkered, particularly if you've got kids and you want a job, you've got to be able to get to your job, you've got to be able to get the kids to school or to childcare. Uh, you cannot operate in this country without a car. So but, uh, the other, other terrible thing, of course, is, this, is, this, is, if, is if you lose your accommodation, where are you going to live? Your car. And we know a hell of a lot of women and kids in Australia currently live in their cars. So that's just a brief summary of what happens. You stay and risk further violence, risk it escalating, uh, you leave and you risk poverty. So that's the stark choice in Australia today for women who are experiencing domestic violence. Thank you for that. Really um, compelling um, arguments put there. I think it's useful too. The thing that struck me is that we make a whole lot of assumptions about how it is women become single mothers. And our policies and government policies are based on those assumptions. What this number tells us, 60% of single mothers with kids under 18 had experienced violence. They became single mothers as a result of leaving the violence. There's a whole lot of assumptions about, in fact, they made poor choices about contraception. They made poor choices um, about why they got pregnant. What this data tells us, and the message that I think we need to talk, be talking more about, as in fact, they made a choice for their children's safety and their own safety, and as a consequence of the poor policies that we've got in place, we then made it harder for them, uh, because our, our kind of income support policies aren't right. But I'm interested, Anne, if you can talk a little bit about the assumptions that lay behind uh, what it is, why it is that we have single mums. Because my reading of your data is that they're making the right choice for their own safety and the safety of their children. And that's, but that's not what the majority of people think are the reasons that people become single mums. I mean, there is still a terrible prejudice against single mothers. It's, it's completely unjustified. It's completely unwarranted by the facts of the situation, as you've just said. But the assumptions you know, largely are that single mothers are either sluts or welfare cheats. And therefore, they get very little sympathy. I that with the, with the, the data that I'm producing, showing that the majority of these women were either married or in de facto relationships um, when these, the violence occurred. So they were, un, they were like the rest of the population. They're, they're, their patterns of cohabitation are very similar to, 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 to couples or to existing couples or continuing couples. Um, it's just that they have uh, decided to leave the relationship or have felt they've been forced to leave the relationship, often in fear of their lives, often literally. I mean, 75% of the women who leave, leave with nothing, no assets at all, not even the children's report cards or photographs. Uh, and you don't do that uh, if, it's a, if it's an amicable breakup, you do that because you're scared of your life. So we, we, we need to understand that and we need to bring into our discussions about single mothers and in particular our payments policies towards single mothers, the fact that these are, we shouldn't be thinking of them as single mothers. We, sh we shouldn't be thinking of them in, in terms of welfare policy. We should be thinking of them in terms of violence against women policy. And one of the, the major things we have to do, and we have to do urgently, and I'm, I'm working very hard to try and make sure that it happens, or I can't make sure, but I'm urging uh, it to happen in the, in the May budget, is for there to be a change in the payments policy. And some of you may remember that these changes that occurred, unfortunately occurred under a Labor government, um, but in, in 2013, 
uh, women were, uh, whose youngest child turns eight were forced off the parenting payment and forced to go on to unemployment benefits. So in effect, they were told they were no longer single mothers, they were now unemployed workers. Uh, their pay dropped, uh, their pay currently is, is $200 a fortnight less than those women who are on the parenting payment. So they, they and in addition to which they are subjected to this horrendous uh, regime of what's so-called mutual obligations where you have to go and, you know, pretend to look for jobs that don't exist uh, or, if, or you lose your benefits. So my um, very strong recommendation is in this budget that all those women uh, need to go, but we have to change the eligibility rules for the parenting payment so that any woman whose child is under 16 or still at school is eligible for the parenting payment. Uh, that's number one. Number two, that I am urging that the parenting payment rates be raised to the same rate as a single age pension. And two things that would do. One is it, it doesn't bring much more money. It's an extra 60 or 70 bucks, but that's, a lot of money when, you, when you're feeding kids. But more importantly, it restores to those women the kind of status and dignity that they had under Whitlam and under Hawke. Now, you might remember, some of you might be old enough here to remember, in 1973, the Whitlam government introduced the Supporting Mothers Benefit. And that was the first time in Australian history that single mothers actually got payment by the state. Prior to that, in, in, if you read my report, you'll see I've done a sort of potted history of the history of, of um, the way in which the state, federal and federal and state, have treated single mothers in this country, and it has been frankly appalling by both sides of politics. Whitlam changed that, so he, he not only gave, not only created a payment that was specifically for single mothers, with no judgment attached to it, but he made it um, a payment equal to a pension with all the entitlements of a pension. Um, th there was no obligation on those women to work. They were, they were regarded as, okay, your, mother, your work is to be single mothers. You could get a job if you wanted to, but you weren't forced to get a job at the way you are now. Now, Bob Hawke not only continued that policy, but he improved upon it by increasing the indexation rate and ensuring that the payment was, every six months when the payment is indexed, that it was tied to male weekly earnings. Kevin Rudd got rid of that and reduced the, the, the way in which the pensions are now indexed so that they're indexed to prices, not to wages. Uh, Julie Gillard made things even worse by, as I've just described. So um, my argument at the moment is that the current Labor government not only has an opportunity, it has an obligation to undo the wrong that was done by the Rudd and Gillard, Gillard governments and go back to treating single mothers the way in which the Whitlam and Hawke governments treated them. Thanks for that. One of the consequences that you touch on in the report as well is the health and mental health consequences. So we've talked about the financial consequences and there are kind of automatic flow-ons to that of their health and mental health. One of the things that struck me, you make the point in the report, was that um, a woman fronting up at an emergency department uh, as a victim of domestic violence doesn't automatically get an MRI, even though she is highly likely to have suffered some kind um, of head injury, but a bloke turning up, this is my analogy, bloke turning up with a football injury uh, may well get an MRI uh, by virtue of the kind of gender imbalance. So maybe you can talk a little bit um, about the health and mental health consequences. Yes, I mean, I, I uh, don't go into this as much as I could have uh, because I wanted to concentrate on the financial consequences because they seem to me to be the most basic because with, without, with money you, can, you have choices, without money you don't. Um, but certainly what we do know, and, we, and one, one very valuable um, source for this research is the uh, longitudinal study, Australian longitudinal study on women's health, which was actually established by the Keating government. Um, in, in, and uh, came into effect in 1996, has been going ever since. So we now have extraordinary data, the 58,000 women uh, aged from their teens to their 90s, uh, data which has been collected every year f since 1996 and which is linked to Medicare, to the PBS, to uh, cancer registries. Um, so we have this extraordinarily rich knowledge of women's health. And what is very, very clear 
from that data is the extent, first of all, the extent of domestic violence disclosed by those women is higher than the numbers in my ABS report. Uh, that's something that needs to be investigated and reconciled, but their numbers are higher and I don't know why. But one of the things that's very clear is the extent to which women suffer trauma, uh, including PTSD, uh, as a result uh, of the um, stress and physical injuries they've received. In many cases, I mean, I have a, a table here in this report, which I'm going to tell you. And, and as you can see, but I've presented it in sort of a tabloid newspaper format in order to dramatise what it is because the figures are so horrendous. I'll just read you a few of them. Um, this is like 82,600 women had, were pushed, grabbed or shoved. 43,200 had something thrown at them. 43,900 were kicked, bitten or hit with a fist. 33,000 were beaten. 25,200 were choked. And we know choking, strangulation, is a precursor to, um, to, 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 to femicide. Um, 10,700 got broken bones, and, and then there's other. 7,200 had other, and other includes broken teeth, gunshot, stab, miscarriage, etc. Um, so the, so the, the extent of the physical violence is is terrible and much, much worse, and there's very good stats on this from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare about the numbers of women who go through the emergency system and who are just, um, uh, diagnosed with domestic injuries, um, not necessarily getting the kind of treatment they should get. One area that is very under-researched and, un and therefore not really understood is the extent to which a lot of women um, who suffer domestic about violence endure brain injury, um, undisclosed brain injury, um, and that is something that I think um, we really need to investigate. One of the other figures in my um, report, which is really horrifying, is the very, very high number of women um, who have, have experienced violence who suffer from a, dis a physical disability. And what we don't know, uh, because this is not a longitudinal study, what we don't know is whether the disability was the result of the violence or whether it's something which has exacerbated the violence. Uh, we just don't know. But the figures are so bad that they really deserve urgent investigation. So when we, when we uh, sort of blandly talk about domestic violence, we're talking about a range of, very serious range of physical, mental, emotional and other forms of violence, each of which um, impact the lives of the women and the children, of course, who witness this. If they don't experience it themselves, they certainly witness it and are traumatised themselves by it. And I want to come back. Um, you've touched a bit on the policy proposition that you've put to the Albanese government around some changes that they might be able to start to make uh, in their budgets. And I want to come back uh, and ask you about the work that you're doing in your new position going forward. But I also want to ask, is there hope? Because 50 years as an activist, 50 years ago, you squatted in a disused empty house in Sydney to try and, and then, you know, sold dope to raise money to buy, uh, to buy stuff to, you to make... You don't much to make that house livable. Is there hope, though? What are, the, what are the key kind of points of change that you've seen along the way that tells us we can make change in this area? Well, I mean, the reason that I'm doing this work is I believe that we can change things, but I do believe that um, we've been... We, we've, that we need to do a lot of things differently. I think that we need to be um, more rigorous with our, our stats, and that's why I'm doing data work. I'm not doing surveys. I'm not going out and asking individual women about their experiences. We know a lot about that. There's a huge amount of experiential um, stuff written about victim survivors and, and, and their experiences. What we want are sheer numbers, and it's when I put these numbers in front of politicians that they are so shocked that they actually listen. 
You just, you just say, oh, well, Mary, Mary got beaten up and, you know, she left and her kids are now living in poverty. I say, oh, yeah. Um, but if you, say, if you say 60% of single mothers are single mothers because they left violent relationships, or if you say that, you know, 74,000 women were strangled or whatever, those figures really have an impact. So I think it's important that we can quantify the impact of violence in a way that we haven't done before. And I'm hoping that will be uh, a means of shocking policy, uh, policy makers and others, including all of us, into saying, okay, you know, enough is enough. We've got to start getting serious about this stuff. Now, what I'm doing with my current job, I've just, uh, bit, uh, my, my, be, have just been appointed for, uh, I used to not be an effing ac academic, but I am now. <laughs> Uh, funny how the wheel turns. Um, so I've been appointed for three years by uh, the University of Technology Sydney in their Department of School of Business, and I'm funded by the Paul Ramsey Foundation, which is a very large philanthropic foundation whose mission is to deal with social disadvantage in Australia. And I have two projects. Um, the first one is to look at the impact of domestic violence on women's employment. Now, this is prompted by the fact, by two things. One is, I, I mentioned at the very beginning the 275,000 women who currently live in violent relationships, a fully a third of those women are not in employment. The other figure is, uh, that is also in my report, is that 50% 50, 50 of women generally who are experiencing violence are not in employment. So there are a couple of things here. One is, first question, why not? Um, what is is it that is preventing them from being in employment? I mean, the, the, the participation rate for women in Australia at the moment is 64%. For women who are experiencing violence, it's 50%. So that is a very, very big difference. And I would say that any government which is trying to encourage labor, la women's labour force participation, as this government is, with its childcare policies and its parental leave policies and its other policies, ought to now start considering domestic violence as an inhibitor of women's workforce participation, and let's find out why that is. So I'm just getting started on this. I don't have any answers yet, but we have to find out why. Uh, we can make various assumptions, you know, but we want hard data as to what, why this is and what we can do about it. And already, you know, I've got so much anecdotal stuff. I tell people I'm doing this work and every day another woman comes to me with a story about the why, why she had to leave work because of her situation. Um, so I don't know if the data exists. If it doesn't, we're gonna have to create it. We're gonna have to get it, a bit, but we need to be able to document that and why. The second project, which is, probably sounds a bit esoteric, um, but this is one future, and that is that I am going to be designing and getting, or hopefully getting the government to accept the need for a new longitudinal study of Australian society. Uh, at the moment we have the census and that's all. Um, we, we need a study that looks at a range of social issues but focuses on domestic violence and particularly focuses on perpetrators because we know nothing about perpetrators. And so we're going, you know, we have all these programs about what to do about domestic violence and we're just, we're, we're going blindly because we don't really know if, you know, that's one bloke who's just moving from woman to woman to woman, it's a serial perpetrator, um, or, you know, there's, there's the, the quiet man who's the, you know, you, you know, we just don't know. We don't know anything about it. All we know is that the men who volunteer themselves for men's, men's behaviour change groups, we learn something from them, but we don't learn nearly enough because there aren't enough of them coming forward, um, and I don't think they're necessarily typical. So this is, this is a project, if, if the government will agree to do it, it's a very expensive, but I think we have a government fi finally at the moment which is interested in data and which is interested in violence and is particularly interested in perpetrators. So when stars are aligned in a way, it's very, very expensive. It will be 10 years before we know anything. So this is an investment in the future. This is policy making for the future. This, is, this will be creating the data that we need to make sensible policies in the future that will, we hope, reduce, if not end, domestic violence. Thank you for that. Uh, the other question I wanted to ask you about, I guess, is linked to that. 50 years of activism, is there hope? We, we, you make the point 
uh, women's economic status is front and centre of the national debate, childcare, you know, if this government, the, the Albanese government can get it right, that will make a significant difference to women's capacity to participate meaningfully in the economy. And then we look at our friends in the US and Roe versus Wade, and we're back to, there is no hope, let's go slash our wrists again. We're about in Western Australia to upgrade our abortion laws, which were put in place uh, by a number of women, some of whom sitting right down there. Um, but it's time for an update. What can you share with us about your views about how the position of women uh, internationally is travelling as well? Well, I, I, I think when we talk about the US, we, we're not talking, you know, we can't say that represents the rest of the world. So, I mean, the, the US is a special case. I mean, I, I, I can't say what's happening in Europe, I can't say what's happening elsewhere. All we can talk about is what's happening here. And fortunately, we, uh, you know, there doesn't seem to be the um, lunatic element in this country in sufficient numbers to, to do what has happened in the United States. The thing about the United States that, that you know, I keep stressing to people and that people have, don't have, have trouble grasping it, that they were so shocked when this happened. They were so surprised. The Republican Party have been saying for 50 years they were going to get rid, rid of Roe v Wade. It's been their policy for 50 years. To every, you know, it's been their litmus test for the appointment of judges, their litmus test for the pre-selection of politicians. They have been getting set to do this for 50 years. And why didn't we believe them? Why didn't we take them seriously? Why didn't we try and stop them? And that is a very serious question, I think, for the Democrats who, who have been far too naive in this and still don't have a clue what to do. And, I mean, it's very, very um, hard to know what's going to happen because a couple, I'll just give you a couple of examples. One, as we all know, you know, the mad governor of, of Florida, Ron DeSantis, who, you know, God help us, might be the next Republican candidate for president, you know, had brought in this, this requirement that all teen, teenage um, um, girls who do athletics have to register their periods with the government, um, there's been a, such a reaction to that that's actually been repealed yesterday, thank goodness. Um, but that's, that's how they think. Um, federally, the Federal Congress, which of course is uh, Democrat controlled in the Senate, but Republican controlled in the House, they want to create a national website that would register all women's pregnancies and track all women's pregnancies. Why? Um, but the thing that's most alarming um, is, and I would, I would urge, I would say to you that if you're interested in this subject, there's a, a daily newsletter that comes out every day on email by a young woman called Jessica Valenti, and she documents what's happening in tremendous detail. I really highly recommend, and it's free, um, that you, you consult that, because every day she tells you what's happening state by state and across the country. And yesterday she reported that the same um, group that sponsored the, the bill that brought down Roe is now sponsoring, before another Trump-appointed judge, a bill that would ban all uh, medical abortion. In other words, would ban RU486 and all of the abortion drugs. Now, at the moment, the uh, medical abortion accounts for more than 50% of abortions in the United States. The two things they're trying to do is, one, stop it being able to be sent across state lines, ban it from being posted, so that women in, in non-abortion states would not have access to it. But secondly, um, they want to just basically get rid of it altogether. And one of the issues, again, the, the naivety of the Democrats is saying, well, that's OK, you know, just, just come to New York, get it there. No, this federal law would ban it across the country. So the, the so-called non-abortion states or the, the, the pro-abortion states um, that currently where you can go for, for an abortion uh, would not be allowed to do it. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very dangerous, very serious situation. Um, I, 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 can't, I can't possibly predict where it's going to go. You know, one of the things that they... Um, they say, well, if, you know, these girls have their babies and they don't want them, well, well, we'll just set up little, you know, boxes at fire stations and stuff and they can drop the baby off there. And 
Yesterday, first baby dropped off at a fire station in Kentucky. So, you know, this sort of thing is starting to happen. It's, it's horrifying. It's The Handmaid's Tale on steroids. It's Gilead. It's, it's, it's every hor horrifying thing we could think of about turning back women's, not just turning back women's rights, eliminating women's reproductive rights altogether. And you just have to hope that, you know, there are plenty of people fighting against it, but I just hope they get a lot smarter than they've been so far. Thank you for that. I'm going to ask you one final question, then I'll invite Sam back to facilitate uh, Q&A. So if we go back to the work that you're doing at the University of Technology, Sydney, I think it's important to note that your professorship is based in the School of Business. Can you make some comments about why that's an important decision by the University of Sydney? Um, Technology. You, you, Sydney. Yes. <laughs> um, it's interesting when I say to people that I'm at the School of Business doing uh, domestic violence, they say, hmm, it's a bit weird. Uh, shouldn't you be at law or health or social services or somewhere like that? And I say, well, no, actually. I think it's time that we moved the, um, or at least added to the, the to, to the, the study of domestic violence and research into domestic violence to other disciplines, to bring different types of thinking, different types of experience, um, because the, the record so far just on what's been done is not terrific, so we need new thinking, we need new ways of doing it. And one of the things that I've been very uh, conscious of and actually very pleased about since I've started doing this work, um, that I've noticed how many schools of business, economics, taxation, um, in Canberra, for example, the Tax and Transfer Institute is doing major work in domestic violence. There's a, there's a Department of um, Economics and Actuarial Studies. Um, they're doing major work in domestic violence. Um, I have a friend who worked with me on this on this report who's an actuary. Um, she built, There's a global group of feminist actuaries working on domestic violence. So there's all this other stuff happening that's completely outside the radar of the normal conversations on violence, and they are coming up with different propositions and different understandings, and I think we should be you know, learning as much as we can from every possible source. And if, if somebody wants to bring their econometric brain uh, to, the, to the issue of um, you know, what happens to after women leave relationships and why is it they, they lose so much money, which is what I've been doing with Professor Bruce Chapman at the ANU. I think that's very good because no one's done that work before and we need to know it. Thanks so much, Anne. Will you join me in thanking Anne for this part?